what is the church? The church is the people of God, powered by the Spirit of God, guided by the Word of God, working for the glory of God. This is the church. The church is not just a place. The church is the people. The church is not just a monument. It's a movement. The church is not just a building. It's a body. The church is not just an accessory. It's a necessity. This is the church. The Bible says the church is the hope of the world, the salt of the earth, and the city on a hill. The church is the family of God, the body of Christ, and light in the darkness. The church is God's plan A, and there is no plan B. The church is where all kinds of people, from all kinds of places, come together to forsake their sins and to worship their Savior. Where chains are broken and broken hearts are put back together, where prodigals come home and captives are set free, this is the church. Where blind eyes are opened and good news is preached, where the low are lifted up and the proud are brought low, where the lost are found and the helpless find help, where brothers and sisters can find love and acceptance from each other and from their Father in heaven, this is the church. Where the disciples of Jesus are built up in their most holy faith. The church is where the gospel is. The church is where grace is. The church is where God is. The church is you. The church is me. The church is all of us. This is the church. Good morning. I'm Sheila. I'm David. And you can watch our service from anywhere. Welcome, Welcome to, to our, our service. service. How many of you are glad to truly be here this morning? And most of all, how many of you are glad that God rescued you? He reached down and grabbed you from wherever you were in, and, and he saved you, and he set you free. So we're going to sing that on this morning. We're going to make that declaration. Hallelujah, Jesus. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy, yes. Hallelujah, Jesus. You have rescued my life. And I'm never going back. Oh, oh, you have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And I'm Hallelujah. i 
Hallelujah. And for that, God, we just want to say that we want to lift our hands and, and give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Thank you, Jesus. This song simply says that I love you more than anything. Glory to your name, Jesus. I lift my hands in total adoration unto you. You reign on the throne, for you are God and God alone. Because of you, my God, they are gone. Say I lift my hands. I lift my hands in total adoration to you. Oh, you reign on the throne. Oh, you are God. Oh, you are God and God alone. Because of you. Because of you, my cloudy days are gone. I can sing to you. I can sing. I worship band adore you. I worship band adore Just want to tell you. Just want to tell you. That I love you, God. Lord, I love that I praise you. you that I worship you more than anything. Come on and let's make that declaration again. Say, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship you. Just want to tell you and declare you. that I love you. Lord, I love you yeah. more than anything. Oh, 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 oh. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I worship you. I just 
Join us for Overcoming by Faith's Easter Celebrations 2023. Can you see the cross? Join us for our in-person services starting on Saturday, Youth Saturday, April 8th at 5 p.m. featuring performances from special guest Juan Day. They didn't know, couldn't believe that he changed my soul. Yeah. Whoa, they didn't know, couldn't believe that they changed my soul. Got they didn't know. And the Overcoming by Faith Youth Arts Ministries. And on Sunday, join us for our Easter celebration at 9 and 11 a.m. OBF Kids, you will have your He's Risen a Block Party with an outdoor lesson and inflatable fun during both the 9 and 11 a.m. services. So get ready for Easter 2023. Can you see the cross? family. I'm Dr. Jackie and I am super excited to bring to you Permission to Live Free on March 21st. This will be a night of worship, empowerment, and a whole bunch of fun. You'll even be able to ask your real life questions as we sit down and have a conversation around permission to live in freedom. I want you to meet me in the building. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Love you. Overcoming by Faith family and friends, join us for our first and second Sunday Family Gathering Sundays. Featuring our sanctuary service, every first and second Sunday will be in person for our 9 and 11 a.m. services. Parents, don't leave your kids at home. Children's Church will be available during both 9 and 11 a.m. services. All services will be streamed. So whether you join us in person or online, we can't wait for you to worship with us every first and second Sunday for Family Gathering Sundays.
At this time, we would like to acknowledge all first-time guests. Welcome to Overcoming by Faith Ministries online service. All right, OBF family, you know what time it is. Let's welcome all of our brand new guests by sending them different types of emojis to make them feel right at home. If you are a first-time guest and would like to learn more information about our ministry, please follow the link provided to you by your streaming host or text the number you see on your screen. We would also like to send you a first-time visitor's gift either digitally or in the mail. Also, for all members and friends, if you would like to participate in any of our upcoming small group sessions, text CONNECT to the number on your screen. Lastly, if you would like to support our ministry, observe the various options. Thank you for joining us and we pray that you are blessed by today's service. Well, glad you're back. Listen, we are excited that you're a part of our family. Digital family is so cool because you get to get in the Word of God when you can, whether you're home or on the road, wherever you are. It's really important to me that you have this option, and I'm really glad you're here. Uh, we're going to pray for our offering now and say thank you for your support. We believe that when we gather together, whether the Bible says in person or online, you know, the Bible said the Holy Spirit goes where He wills. And so we are given clear guidance in the book of John chapter 3 that the Holy Spirit is not just in one physical place. I believe he's where you are, he's where I am, and so I want to pray for you today. And I want to thank you again for your support. Thank you for the offering uh, that we are uh, going to receive right now. And many of you are just so faithful. Uh, it's amazing. I've watched you over the years, whether you're in the building with us on our first and second Sunday gathering where we're all in person and or whether you are here online. And so thank you for your support. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for the support of your people. I thank you for the blessings of God, having them in our lives. And I thank you for those who honor you with their tithes and offerings. Bless them as they give. May this be a season of blessing for them. And I pray they would prosper in their life, save money, have resources, that they would not just be givers, but they'd be savers. But I pray they'd be joyful givers when they give. And we give you all the praise and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. My name is Pastor Ricky Temple. Let me tell you what, my friend, in a minute, I'm going to share a message with you about something that we all can relate to. It's called debt. That's right, uncontrolled debt. It's going to be a brief message that has a powerful principle, set of principles. The whole series, I hope you've listened to it. If you haven't, go back and watch part one and two. It is really powerful. It is so powerful. And next week, I end with the part four. I want you to listen carefully. This series can help you. It's how you look at your money and how you manage your money that can change your life. So stay with me. Even if you broke, broke, broke. One more broke for you, broke. <laughs> if you are, hang with me. What if you got money? Hang in here anyway. Because a lot of us who have been blessed to do well, sometimes we need another reminder of how we need to wisely manage our resources. So stay with me. It's going to be a great study. And again, thank you for what you give today. These announcements will come and show you how to give. Thank you so much. And God bless you as you give. Overcoming by Faith family and friends, thank you for your support and generosity as we continue to do the work that God has called us to do. It's time to receive our offering and there are many ways that you can give. Visit the Overcoming by Faith website at overcomingbyfaith.org backslash give. You may download the Overcoming by Faith app. You may mail your gift to P.O. Box 15789, Savannah, Georgia, 31416, or text the dollar amount to 912-307-3077. As you give, remember this declaration, good seed sown in good soil. You can follow along with today's message by simply opening the Overcoming by Faith Ministries app. Scroll down to Sermon Notes, and today's notes will open within the OBF app or open directly in the Bible app. Or if you are viewing online you can click the Sermon Notes button on the live stream page. If you are viewing on YouTube or Facebook, access the notes from the description area. you're back. I want to say this series is important to me because this is the topic that some people struggle with. Struggle with this topic because it just, they just struggle with it. Talking about money requires maturity. It does. You have to be able to sit down and say, you know what, when it comes to this topic, I have learned some lessons. I've learned some lessons that will help me, bless me, empower me, and can change my life. Dealing with your money is one of the most important things you'll learn to do. 
And I, I, sometimes I think as, as Christians, we're not good at it, that we're not really that mature when it comes to it. Because most of the time, what you hear in church is give money. You know, it's all about, about tithing and offering. And I think it's wonderful. Thank you for giving. Thank you for honoring God and your gifts and helping us do what we do. But I think you have to get to a place where you understand that people can't give what they don't manage well. So if you don't have resources that, you know, help you do what you want to do, excuse that sentence, then you're, you're just not able to make a difference. And so I want to talk about that. I want to talk about how you can manage your money. And one of the big areas is uncontrolled debt. One of the things that gets out of control, and it's very easy, our society is designed to trap you. And if you are not careful, it gets out of control, and you don't even know how it happened. So you might ask me a question. Pastor Rick, have you ever had un uncontrolled debt? Yeah, sure I have. And how do you know it? Well, it, it ran way beyond what I thought it would. I charged something and thought I could pay it off the next paycheck because I didn't have cash at the time. And the next paycheck came and I could pay only half of it. So that's how you end up with installment payments. There were times when I wanted to go on vacation and I thought, oh, I can just charge it and then I'll pay it when I get back. Well, I spent more money than I planned on spending. And before you know it, it's uncontrolled. If you're a self-employed person, like most pastors are, you know, well, if you have a, uh, a problem with, uh, Paying your taxes, you know, which is you pay it every quarter if you're uh, in certain classifications. Uh, many of you are used to having taxes taken out of your check, but if you're a self employed person and you're supposed to pay your taxes every quarter, I call it the 15th, you know, January 15th. Well, let's start, you start really starts April 15th, April 15th, June 15th, September 15th, and then it's supposed to be January 15th. So you have those four opportunities to pay your taxes and you save up the money paid every quarter. Well, if you're not careful, you save up the money and you say, well, I'll pay half of it or I'll pay a quarter of it or I'll pay a little bit of it. And before you know it, you'll end up with a tax bill that's wicked. Been there, done that and paid it off. Thank God I was blessed to do that. But I learned some lessons from that. First of all, I learned the power of doing a little bit at a time. The best thing to do is take it out every week when you get paid. But here's what I'm, here's what I'm saying. It, it can run away from you. Your expenses can run away from you. Your taxes can run away from you. Your um, your deferred maintenance in your house, that's another thing that can happen. You don't fix things, you let things go and go and go, and your car is squealing and wailing, and you let that go and go and go, your tires are getting bald. Before you know it, you have a, a big pile of issues because you have not dealt with it. And that's one of the reasons why I feel this study is so important, because it addresses that issue of uncontrolled debt. So let me take you down the road a little bit. And I want to refresh your memory if you were not with me for the whole series. There were four, there are four sermons in the series that we promised you. The first sermon dealt with trapped by unnecessary obligations and how uh, sometimes you just get locked into things that you shouldn't have been. You, you, you signed for something. You guaranteed something that you shouldn't have guaranteed. And before you know it, and this, a lot of this is done through co-signing for things. And it's, it's an obligation you, you, you shouldn't have taken on. And sometimes you mean well. I know I meant well, but I took on some unnecessary obligations, and I did that in the first sermon. So you can go back and listen to that one. Second sermon we talked about, trapped by a naive love affair. Boy, love can get you in trouble. Good God Almighty, I'm telling you. <laughs> you're all in love, and you're so in love, you don't look. And I talked about how a lady was in love, but she didn't look. And before you know it, the whole thing blew up in her face. Husband died, and she's left in a mess. It's a trap that a lot of people fall into because you're not aware of your resources. And if you're in a relationship where, and I hope you're both listening, you've got to be fair to each other. You've got to let everybody know what's going on. Put everything on the table. Well, they're going to scream and holler. That's okay. It's better to scream and holler now than to be where that woman was in that second sermon. You need to go back and listen to that second sermon I did. It's called Trapped by a Naive Love Affair. I mean, you're naive, religious, godly, two godly people, church-going people, godly, holy, holy people. Yes, they were holy, but they were broke. And at the end of his life, he died suddenly and the whole family was in a mess. So that's a great sermon to go back and listen to. Third sermon, which is today. I'm going to talk about debt. And there's a book that I want to, I want to put on the screen and I want you to listen. It's a great book. And it's called The Psychology of, of, of Money. And it really is powerful. 
And I want to make sure I got the name right. Hold on. You know, I want to make sure I got the name of the book right. And it is, right, The Psychology of Money. And it's by a guy whose name is Morgan Housel. Morgan Housel. Now, I thought the book was good because it raised a number of powerful principles. But one of the biggest things it talked about was saving for no reason and how you need to put yourself in a position so you can, you can have resources and not have to use debt to solve problems. So debt's often used to save you, and that's how it gets out of control. The only way you're going to fix this is to start lower your debt and save cash. Now, we're not going to go through all of how you do that today, but I want to just say you, you got to first make the decision to face the facts about your resources. Look at your debt and say, this is how much I owe. You know, a lot of people never do that. They never, they never do that. And I want to say, if you're getting ready to marry somebody, don't marry anybody, you don't know the truth. You want to see all the money, put it all on the table and say, okay, let's, let's, let's take a minute here and take, let's look at this money, boy, and see where the money is. Because where the money is is going to tell you a lot about your life. It's going to tell you a lot about where you're going. So trapped by uncontrolled debt happens because we don't look. Next week, we'll talk about financial isolation and how that can become part of the big reason why you can't be free. If you're isolated, you're doing it all by yourself. You don't let anybody help you when you need help. I think that's a tragedy, tra tragic mistake. Let me read the text I read from the very beginning of our study, 2 Kings chapter 4. I referenced it a minute ago. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 says this. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elijah, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two sons, my two boys as his slaves. Now I'm going to stop there and say this. That was the launching pad thought I wanted you to, to weigh out. Good woman, godly woman, godly husband, good people. But here's the trap. He, they had debt that was out of control. And now they were going to put their sons in debtor's prison. Now, you don't have that today. But back in the day, <laughs> when you couldn't pay your debt, they came and got your children. Some of you said, well, all of you would be gone. Every one of you would be gone someplace laboring to pay off my debt. That's exactly right. That's how they dealt with it. So this is a moment where this woman is cornered and a, the proverb becomes true in her life. Let me read another verse to you. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. Now I want you to think about that. This is all about power and slavery. It enslaves you. The system is designed to enslave you. I want to say that again. The economic system is designed to enslave you, not empower you. I know that I want to feel empowered when I buy certain things. I saw I had a friend, he, used to, he had an American Express card, and I was so impressed. A gold American Express card. And he flashed that thing, and I went, ooh. I just like the way it looked. So I got me one. And I'm going to tell you right now, one of the things I've learned about credit cards in particular is they are a statement. They can be a blessing. I use them. But I don't use them anymore, I've learned, unless I have the cash to pay for it now. I have to make myself understand the power of now payments. Because if I'm not careful, it will quickly enslave me. I, I, I kindly say it's the devil in your pocket. <laughs> Even though I got them. I have credit cards. I do. But I am, I, am, I am totally committed at this stage of my life. I tell people, I'm 64. It takes you a while to get sense. It took me a while to really understand, no, you can't, you can't win this battle. As long as I spend more than I make, I will always have uncontrolled debt. As long as I do that. So if this is going to be a lifestyle for you until you die, okay, we accept that. But I want to say to those of you who want to hear what I'm saying today, the way to stop this is to realize I can't spend what I don't have. You might say you need things. I would say I understand there can be moments when you need something, you know, for example, and we'll talk about this another thing we talked about a little bit earlier, how a car, okay, you know, if you got a car, that makes sense. I mentioned that in the series. If you have car debt, you hey, you got to get around, you got to go to work. You got to go to school. You got to get education because you're in, uh, you want to improve yourself. I get that. But I'm not talking about those debts. You have to have a place to stay. I understand that. 
I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking about mortgage debt. I'm talking about you incur, uh, incurring debt that runs away from you because you're, you're in all the areas that you can control, you're not controlling it. And so let me give you, if I can, eight observations about you that I think are very important. I call these eight observations about you. And I want you to kind of take a step back, look at yourself, and I want you to remember a couple of things. And this will help you kind of face and deal with the debt issue in your life. Number one, look at your name. The power in your life is your name. How you use your name, what your name stands for, it has power in your life. The Bible says this, a good, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed in better is, uh, is better than silver and gold, Proverbs 22. What I wanted to do was I wanted to go back in chapter 22 of Proverbs and analyze why he made, what was the context in which he made the statement. Remember the statement? The rich, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower servant to the lender. So I wanted to go back a little bit and say, well, what made him talk about that? What, what was, what was the, the, the prerequisite to that? Now, I know when you read Proverbs, a lot of Proverbs kind of stand on their own. They're kind of like great sayings, and they can kind of stand on their own. But I just wanted to go back and, and look at the neighborhood of that verse and, and just kind of see what other things he talked about. And I love the fact that he talked about the power of your name. It, it has, it, there's something about valuing that. Controlling your debt will help value and protect your name. Second thing he talks about is, he links, he, he, I love this, your link to wealth is, is very interesting. Your link to wealth. He says in verse 2, rich and the poor have this in common. They're linked together. The Lord is the maker of them all. There's a common link that you have with everybody. You have a link to wealth just like anybody else. You may not have the le same level of wealth, but there's a linkage he talks about. He said a good name is important. He said the rich and the poor both have one thing in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. So you have access to God. They have access to God, you have access to God. Now, you may not have the same gift that they have, but God is, God is linked to you. You have a link. Third thing I want you to think about is your decisions. Think about this now. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Understand that the power in a decision will determine the level of debt you have. The prudent man looks and says, I'm getting worse. Now, our country is not doing that right now. Our country is just going forward and spending money. I understand, you know, but at some point, you got to pay the piper. It shows up in inflation. It shows up in other areas. I understand that some people argue, well, the more debt you get, the better things go. But you have to have a deadline. You have to have, if you're going to leverage yourself in debt, there needs to be a target or a goal. And that's tied to your decisions. So think about this for a minute. Your decisions equal good options if you make good decisions, but it also can equal bad options. I have something that I've been saying a lot lately. Bad choices lead to bad options. Bad choices. Don't pay your taxes on a quarterly basis when you're in business for yourself. You know, fudging on it, fudging on it, fudging on it. Before you know it, you're going to have more taxes than you want to have. Believe me, you don't want that. Secondly, if you spend more than you make, all this is important. And you protect your name when you do that. You protect your name. You take advantage if you are wise with the link you have to God. And if you go to God and say, hey, look, God, you bless the rich person, you can bless me. I'm linked to the same God that blesses them. But it doesn't work if you keep making bad decisions. Your decisions matter. You can't just pray and say, God, prosper me, bless me, and your decisions are bad. And there's, there's something about backing up the train a little bit and saying, okay, I need to, I need to, ball, I need to come to a, this fourth thing here I want to talk about, humility. So your name, your link to wealth, then your decisions, and then your humility. Here's what the Bible says. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor in life. Humility is the fear of the Lord. It pays you with riches, I love this, and honor. And life. If you can be humble for a moment and say, okay, Pastor, you're right. I, 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 need, I need to make better decisions. And it starts today. I need, I need to pause something. I need to, I need to back up on the train a little bit here. I need, I need to make a, a different 
uh, a different move. And there's something about that, certain decisions. And number five, you need to also make sure you notice your pitfalls. So if you're taking notes, I said your name, your link to the wealth, your decisions, your humility, your pitfalls. What makes you fail? What is it that messes you up? Look at verse five. In the paths of the wicked are snares and pitfalls. But those who would preserve their life stay far from them. I must admit, I, I have pitfalls. If I were to go back in my life, I'd say, yeah, I can remember I bought something, I did something, I, and it was a pitfall. For some of you, it's cars. For some of you, it's vacations. For some of you, that might have been one of mine. You know, I could own that one. It might have been. I might have spent too much on some vacation. As a matter of fact, my wife and I had an agreement. I kind of turned it over to her for a minute because I was, I mean, I believe in good vacations now, let me tell you. And I would wow them. And I think this is fine. You know, we survived it all, but you've got you, you to find a way. Uh, we probably cut our vacation expenses in half. I mean, literally in half, if I give dying credit with a tight self. But there are moments when you have to say, if we're trying to save, you know, if you can afford it, good. And, and we felt based on, and I felt based on our income, we could. And I'm not saying we didn't have a great time. And she said we have a great time. But there's a pitfall if there's never a boundary. And for some of you, you've had a good party so far. Here's what I'm saying. The party's over. If you want to get control of your debt, you got to say, okay, going forward, we're going to have to make decisions a little bit differently. And you may have to switch who does the ordering of the, of the food or who orders the, the vacations. You may have to switch like Diane and I did. We switched with stands. And she took over a number of things for me. She took over some business areas for me. And she said, you know, let me do that for you. And what she's done, and if I'm, really, I'm really thankful, she helped with uh, the record keeping. She helped with a number of things in my life which made it better. What, is, what are the pitfalls in your life? What are the things you need to release? What are the things you don't need to do because you're too busy, you got too much going on? For some of you, the pitfall is you cleaning the house. You don't need to clean the house because you're not good at that. Let them do it. The lawn's going to always be growing up and go get a lawn, man. Just, the, the pitfall is you're trying to do things that you don't have time to do or that you can't do well. So what are your pitfalls? Number six, look at your children. I love this. I love this. Start children off on the way they should go. And even when they're old, they will not turn from it. Now, remember, the goal of my conversation here is, Proverbs 22, verse 7, there's a statement made. And the statement talks about slavery and how debt puts you, makes you a slave. He says the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. And I was curious. I said, well, I wonder what was said before this verse. I also understand in Proverbs, as I said, a lot of the statements are just anecdotes, just one-liners that just apply just to this one section. It's not necessarily a context where you have, you know, there's a linkage. But I thought there were several things said prior to verse 7, Proverbs 22, that were worth you thinking about. The first one talks about your name. The second one talked about your link to wealth, that God as a plan, God, the same God who blesses the wealthy people can bless you. Thirdly, we talked about your decision making and how your decisions affect your wealth. Then we talked about your humility. If you're not humble, you'll hinder your wealth. Then we talked about your pitfalls. Remember the things that are pitfalls in your life, being honest about those. Then he talked about your children. I love this part. If you're in debt and you're in bondage, you will pass that same spirit on to your children. I watch parents go buy their kids a car and give them the payment as if it's a gift, and they don't help them pay off the car. They give them this large, than life payment, too. You might say, well, you ain't, Pastor Rick, you gave them a debt. I'm not saying, you know, thank you. I'm, I'm sure they're glad to be driving around, but the reality is sometimes we, we pass to our children a culture that doesn't necessarily help them. What I love, and I want to take just the first part of this verse because it's one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. It says, start children off on the way they should go. Start children off on the way they should go. And when they're old and when they get down the road, they will not depart from it. But your job is to start them off. Here's a question, just about debt for a minute. Do you think you're starting them off right? 
Uh, there are a lot of mistakes I think you can make as a parent. One is to give them no money to manage and then expect them to be able to manage money when they get to college, but all their life they've had no money. I personally am a believer in allowances. I personally am not a believer in making, you know, this is my approach. You know, we don't have them, you know, make the bed and get $5 and sweep the courts and get $2. I understand that there's a rhyme and a reason for people doing that. Now, God bless you for doing it that way. But God gave Adam and Eve a planet and didn't charge them anything. He gave it to them and then told them how to manage it. What often happens is your children never get enough money under that system to manage. They have pennies to manage. So when they get to college, they don't know how, when they get out of your house, they don't know how to manage money. They don't know anything about the bills, the debts. When they go on vacations, they don't see the, what the cost. I always wanted them to see what it costs. If I traveled someplace and somebody gave me an honorarium, I showed them what I got for speaking. I wanted them to be a part of it. I had a little bank system called Temple Bank and Trust where I would deposit money, and hold it for them, and when they could check money out, you know, I had them fill out a little deposit slip, a withdrawal slip. I did everything I could to try to help them at least understand how to make money and how to manage money the best we could. Now, I know that your kids learn more sometimes once they leave your house, and I think my kids have learned a lot since they left my house. But the point I want to get to is, you have to train children up. You have to see that that's your job, to start them off. The, the goal is to start them off in the way that they, they should go. This is a verse that's misunderstood a lot because really it's about finding a kid's gift and purpose and help the kid get to that gift and purpose. But you start them off. And one good way to start them off is to make sure that you understand what they need. And one of the things they need is lessons about money. Help them figure it out. Help them find their path. And then the seventh thing that we want to talk about is he talks about your debt. Now, that's where verse 7 comes in. In verse 7, he says, I'm going to read it again, the rich rule over the poor. Those with money will rule over you. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Now, this is not a, a prohibition against borrowing money. Uh, there's other texts in the Bible that talks about borrowing money and how you should lend money, but not at an unfair interest rate. That's another big issue. A lot of the ways things are structured, credit cards in particular, they're structured to never be paid off. The whole system is designed to keep you a slave, to stay in your pocket. And that is a trap. Some of you have never had a paycheck that you owned. Before it came to you, it was already divided up. Imagine a world when that's not true. Your debt has not been good to you, but you can get out of it if you're willing to be honest, back up your train a little bit. And let me tell you, one of the reasons you want to do that is because you're children. You want to show them what true wealth is. The book I mentioned earlier, The Psychology of Wealth, I love the, the arguments he makes. He tells a story about how his father was a doctor and his father wanted to leave medicine. And he's, he diligently saved for years and he used to be frustrated with his dad because his dad was always saved. And he said, but one day his dad, it was an emergency room doctor, and after 20 years, he just decided, I don't want to do this anymore. And he just left. And he could leave. And that's his point in the book. Being able to do, think about this now, what you want to do when you want to do it. That's the goal, to get to a place. You know, one of the deficits, and I, I said this the other day in a session I was in, I said, you know, I realized that I didn't know anybody who retired with money. They used to have a piece of money. You ever heard the term piece of money? But I didn't know anybody that had money. I didn't. I mean, literally, they only had their Social Security check and whatever they could piece together. There was no abundance. So I didn't fully understand retirement. I never really planned. In my earlier days, I learned as I got older that I needed to save and work toward retirement. But I realized that there is something that can happen to you in life where life changes and you can't work the same job you had all your life. And, and a lot of people are not prepared or they're not preparing for it. Some of you are in church in jobs where they have 401ks, they have other, other vehicles and you're not even trying to save any money. That's why this is not a good plan. The rich rule over the poor and the borrower. If you spend all your life borrowing and never move past that, you will eventually be a slave. So those are seven words that I think can help you think about this issue of debt. Now I'm going to give you one more. Are you ready? Generosity. Your generosity. I, I, I believe there's a direct link between 
your generosity and your ability to manage prosperity and wealth. Let me read it for you. It's in verse 8. Whoever sows injustice reaps calamity, and the rod they wield in fury will be broken. The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I, I am convinced that being a generous person pays off. If I live just for me, and it's all about me, and it's all about my money, and it's all about what I have, and it's all about what I can do for my family, and I don't think about anybody else, I think it's tragic. And I'm going to say this about churches. I think churches are often not generous. We teach people to give us money, but if you look at what we do with our money, sometimes, if we're honest, we're not really generous. We're not giving it to the community. We're not, it's, it's not going anywhere. It needs to be that you can measure that we're, we're, we have a culture of generosity. And for people who work in the church especially, I think they should be paid well. For people in the community, that we should be spending our money outside of the building. I think we should get beyond just building, a, putting up buildings. I spent years of my life, and I'm not, um, uh, boy, how can I say this? I, I think I, 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 want to, I want to be fair to myself. Buildings have been necessary for me. This is all necessary. I need to have a building. I have to have a place to gather. But the problem is if I spend all my life just thinking about a building and I don't have any resources to, to, to be generous, to help people, then what good is the building that I come to once a week? I need to be clear that sometimes in life, our approach to money is all about us. I always ask people this. Tell me the most you've ever given to anybody outside of your kids. What's the most money you ever gave to somebody beyond your children, your husband, your family, your mama, your cousin? How generous are you? There's stories I can tell you of how the Holy Spirit has, has built in, and, and, and pushed into my heart and mind the, the power of being generous. And you know how you know? Because you can give. And you can give without regret. I was in a um, hotel one day, and it was a friend. And um, I, I was, and I still am kind of a suit guy. I like suits and ties. This is a big change for me to dress like this. But I like this. I mean, when I say, I want, I mean, the, I want to be at the, the nine, ten. I want, to, I, want, I want it to all match. I want the tie. I want the whole bit. And the shoes to match. I mean, I like that kind of stuff, right? So I was in this hotel. And I had these, these beige shoes. They were sweet. And, and a friend of mine walked by, and, and I was getting them shined at this, and I like to go get a good old shine on them. And um, he, he walked by and said, man, those are some bad shoes. Man. And he said, what size you wear? And I told him, we were the same size. And, and right then, it came to me, give him your shoes. Give them to him. Give, give him, now, now my thought would be, no, nah, no, nah, he make he make good money. He don't need my shoes. <laughs> but in that moment, in that moment, the Lord challenged me. And he, you know, he told me, he said, no, I, I felt that you would. He said, but I got plenty of shoes, Rick. Thank you for the offer. I remember a time I had on a jacket, a jacket that I really like, a Lakers jacket. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I grew up in Los Angeles. I was born in Savannah, Georgia, but grew up in LA. And I've got a, a, a special Painful place in my heart for the Lakers. It's painful right about now. And I had on this Lakers jacket. It had all the championships on it. It was wonderful. And while I was doing, uh, for a season of my life, I pastored two churches. I pastored in, in Los Angeles, and I pastored here in Savannah. And I was doing bi-coastal travel every week. It was a big season of my life for about three years. But one, one of the things that I did was I, we had a, in that church I pastored in L.A. called The Church on the Way, we had a radio station. And I went to the radio station to talk to one of the staff, and I had on that jacket. And I felt I was looking good that day, right? And he looked at me, and the guy made such a big deal about the jacket. I mean, he just, man, he got up off his desk. When he worked in our radio station. He got up off his desk. Oh, Pastor Rick, man, wow, man, where'd you get that? That's, boy, that's, and he just went on and on. And in that moment, 
it came to me. Give him your jacket. Yeah. I said, the devil, I rebuke you. <laughs> and I took it off. The jacket was no longer mine. I said, come here, try it on. Let me see how you look in it, since you like it so much. And he tried it on, and he looked in the mirror. He said, boy, this is sweet, man. I love it. And I said, it's yours. And the whole office was like, you kidding. I said, no. If it means that much to you and you love this jacket, I'm going to give you this. That's generosity. Generosity is giving what you want. A friend of mine once, he told me the last story, a friend of mine who's gone on that, Robin Gould, Robin Gould, pastor, pastor in Charlotte, North Carolina, good friend of mine, passed recently. Robin Gould came to my church and I was showing him where we have clothes here for the unfortunate people. And I had them all in a nice rack in the back of the church. Uh, we were back on East Broad. You may not know where that is. If you're in Savannah, you know where that is. We had an East Broad, East Broad and Siler Street. We had a building there, and a friend of mine is pastoring there now. But we went, we went, um, he came in, and he looked in, he said, um, he looked at the, the little rack of clothes we had, and he said, we're, we, 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 we do the same thing, but we, we just give away new clothes with tags on them. I just sat back and said, well, okay. And I'm going to tell you, from that day to this day, when we give clothes away, I'm not saying it's wrong to give clothes away to you. That's the very Salvation Army, a lot of places do that, and that's good. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, I've done that. I do that. But as a church, we only give away stuff with tags on it now. We let the goodwill and them do the other stuff. That inspired my generosity. Another friend, I, I told you the last story, I, he told me the amount of money he gave to God on an annual basis in tithes and offerings. I ain't going to say that amount because it scared you. It might scare you. They said it. It was several thousand dollars. And he made a commitment. He said, I honor God every, every year with this much money. And he made a, and I'm telling you, the, it, it was eye popping to me. It was eye popping to me. I, I, I'll, I'll give you close. It's, it's, it's above 10,000. And it was, in, in my mind, it was way past 10,000, but I ain't going to bother you in your head. I want to just say, he, when he said that to me, I, I immediately, was inspired and began to pray, Father, give me a spirit of generosity at a higher level. And, and I'm telling you, there's something about having a, a heart. See, you want God to bless you. You want God to get you out of debt. But if you're not careful, your debt is a symbol that all your money is about you and all of your obligations are about you. It's not about other people. I want you to understand. I understand some of you that's not true, but I want you to hear me. Uncontrolled debt will keep you a slave. Look at these things we talked about today and ask yourself a question. When am I going to back up my train a little bit? Reanalyze my life and make a different set of decisions to change my financial future. I want to pray for you. Father, I pray that what we've talked about today has inspired them to be generous. I pray that it would, it would inspire them to go out and make a difference in the world around them. I pray they would lift their hearts and their hands and say, you know, God, prosper these hands, not just for me. Lord, let my name reflect your glory when you look at my finances. Father, let my children be blessed when, it, when my children look at my finances. Father, I pray that the pitfalls that I've been falling into over and over again that I'd be humble enough to let you teach me how to get out of them. I pray God that just like you bless the wealthy, you can bless me. And I thank you and I praise you in advance as I honor you first. Father, help us to understand the power of that. I honor you first. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now listen, I want you to take what you've heard today and look at your life and say, okay, I want to deal with this. And then I, I, I'm committed to not being isolated all by myself dealing with this. I want, I want, to, I want to join with people. And I want, to, I want to see my life move to another level of financial blessing. And when it comes to generosity, I want to honor God first, honor myself second. That's what I believe in doing. Honor God, honor myself, and then honor others. My little principle is 10, 10, 20, 30 rule, I call it. When I, when I get paid, the first thing I do is I honor God. I have a little ceremony I do. When I get my check, I pray. 
I said, okay, Father, I'm honoring you. I thank you for this gift in my life. And then I give. Then I honor myself. And if I can give 10%, I call it 10, 10, 20, 30 rule. If I can give 10% minimum, I try to give myself 10%. If I can, I give 5%. If you can't, you give 2%, but you give yourself something. Then, but my prayer for you is 10 for God, 10 for you. And if, you, if you're really doing good, give 20. And if it's amazing, God gave you extra money that week or month, 30%. Set it aside and live on the rest. The goal is to come up with a number. I don't care what your percentages are. You can do 10, two, 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 I don't care, but you're going to need to start setting it aside and saying to yourself, I'm not going to live where I am. I'm going to start with what I have and begin a saving strategy, a giving strategy, a generosity strategy, and my name is going to change. I'm not going to live in uncontrolled debt. I got to go. My time's up. And I thank you for being with me today. I pray I said something that will help you. The next sermon, when I talk about isolation, is important because a lot of you that have this view, if my business and ain't nobody going to know my money. Well, if you're not careful, that's going to leave you isolated and you'll never have certain opportunities. You got to open the door and let somebody help you. I'll see you more next time. Now, if you're here today, I'm going to pray one final prayer for you. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you've never given Jesus your life, today could be the day. For some of you, this is a moment for you to make a decision. So I want you to pray with me. Father, I pray for those today who've heard this message and realize that they need Christ in their life. They realize that they're walking with God. They may be financially blessed, but they've never offered you an opportunity to be the Lord of their life. Let this be that moment, I pray. And I pray for a breakthrough in their life, their finances, and their spiritual life. And may they open their hearts to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now listen, right there on the screen, for some of you that are watching on, online, there's an opportunity for you to say, hey, I want to raise my hand and acknowledge Christ. For some of you right now, you're sitting there saying, man, I need to make this decision. I, and, and I need to find myself a good church, a good place I can grow, get around some believers. If you're not much of a church person, get around some believers that can help you grow, people that can help inspire your faith. And I pray that you would become a generous person, that God would bless you and prosper you, that you learn the power of getting out of debt. I pray this whole sermon, this whole experience is one that you won't forget. If you got a prayer request, you got something you want me to pray with you about, pastor at overcomingbyfaith.org. That's pastor at overcomingbyfaith.org. Send in those prayer requests. I promise I'll pray for you. God bless you. I'll see you next time. And by the way, if you're online, write your prayer request in that chat, and they'll be glad to pray with you right then or send you something. We're so glad you're with us. I'll see you next time. Remember, our in-person services every first and second Sunday, in person. Come live, food, food trucks. We hang out together. It's a blast, 9 and 11 o'clock every first and second Sunday. That's called Family Gathering. We all come together. It's wonderful. And 9700 Middle Ground Road in Savannah, Georgia. I'll see you then. Be blessed. If not, I'll see you online. Bye-bye. Hey, this is Pastor Rick. I hope you have enjoyed listening to our messages. I want you to like and share and subscribe. We appreciate you being with us today and help us share the word. Remember, you get to be a part of this. Thank you for being on the team.